<clears throat> and uh, thanks for coming to the talk. I'd like to thank the folks at Spark Summit and uh, for having me. And it's been fun watching a few talks yesterday and today that real-time image recognition, or at least the image recognition part, has been a hot topic. Uh, just earlier, I was at another talk from Martin at uh, Cloudera talking about modeling at scale. So a lot of great content at the conference today and yesterday. So let's dig in. I'm going to talk briefly about visual computing, uh, real-time image recognition. I'm going to have a quick demo that's going to showcase the ability to do real-time image recognition at memory bandwidth speed, uh, and then talk a little bit about distributed data stores. So let's jump in a little bit about visual computing. Uh, the future of computing is visual. I don't think there's any doubt about that any longer. Um, but the good part about us being in the computer industry is it's also numerical. Uh, so there's a lot behind those images. Uh, why is this important? Today, the world's four most valuable companies all have massive investments, million, perhaps billion dollar investments in various types of image recognition, augmented reality, and so forth. Let's just take a look at a few of these things. Apple, of course, made a big uh, noise about Face ID. They are also making uh, components of their Face ID available to developers. Uh, they also have a big augmented reality initiative underway. Uh, companies like Google uh, are also pursuing all kinds of augmented reality. It's a video showing there on the screen. Yep. And then, you know, things like their uh, daydream goggles. Uh, Microsoft uh, is making a big push with the HoloLens. Uh, and then recently, Facebook hosted a conference on the, the Oculus. And so all kinds of things going on with imagery in the Facebook world and, and the Oculus goggles. And so you know, that, there's a lot going on there. And, and so if you're not one of those four companies, what are you going to do? Well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit today and how you can develop you know, some of the similar technologies that, that these companies are using. So a little bit about image recognition today, what's happening in the marketplace and with customers. Uh, MemSQL has been working with an organization called Thorn that provides digital defense for children. And what they do is they help track uh, on the unfortunate activity that happens on the internet uh, to see if they can prevent uh, sexual exploitation. We help them improve their real-time image recognition process uh, by as much as a thousand-fold by helping them compare the facial image recognition vector of one face against a database of hundreds of millions of images to match. And so by making that process uh, significantly faster, they can provide tips to law enforcement that uh, basically help save uh, children's lives. Uh, we have another customer that's uh, pursuing real-time image recognition uh, with an application that lets you sort of take a picture with your phone and identify that product. And you can see the speed of this application by just you know, taking a click uh, and uh, of that particular product. You have the ability to, to bring that product up in, in real time. And of course, this leads to all kinds of opportunities with uh, commerce and so forth. Uh, but you can really see the power of how this is affecting our daily lives uh, through these examples. So let's talk a little bit about real-time image recognition and uh, more specifically uh, how that uh, works in detail. So you know, three stages. The first is uh, building and training models. And this is where all of the goodness of Spark comes into play. There are lots of other options out there. Uh, today, I'm going to walk through an example with OpenCV uh, and hog descriptors. And the goal of, of that process is, again, building and training the models. From that comes the ability to extract feature vectors and to start to classify images based on those feature vectors. And so you take the model, you take the image, you develop a feature vector, and then you want to build a real-time application. And so it, today, what I'm going to walk through is an example of taking that feature vector sticking it in a MemSQL table, and using a function called dot .product uh, to do feature comparison in real time. So when we get to the uh, database portion of this, we're creating a table called features, which has an ID and a feature vector that's about 4K. And we put that in a, uh, our column store, and then we're able to run different kinds of operations on that. So in working with feature vectors, again, we have every image we store has an ID. 
and a normalized uh, feature vector. Again, today the example will be in 4K. And then to find similar images, we can basically just do simple SQL statements where we're selecting from the features table using the dot product function as a comparison. And a little bit more about dot product, if you're not familiar with dot product, sometimes it's called scalar product. And this is a well-known mathematical function. You can look it up on Wikipedia. And basically, it's allowing you to compare two vectors uh, for similarity. There are different implementations. You can do cosine similarity. You can do Euclidean distance. Um, and dot product itself is not new. So I, I don't want you to get that impression. But what is new is the ability to run dot product in a distributed relational store that provides native SQL access, uh, the ability to run in memory or on disk, and, and really start to build these operational applications that you know, finish this last mile. Yesterday and today, we hear a lot about developing models and all the great uh, tools that we have available. Uh, but it seems like in the discussions that have been taking place, that last 5% about putting things into production, uh, that's a lot of the hard work. And so one of the things is when you can combine the ability to do you know, uh, real-time ingest from Spark and provide SQL access to any developer in your organization who's familiar with SQL and combine dot product, that's where a little bit of the magic starts to happen. So there are also some performance enhancing techniques that we use to uh, take advantage of, of, of dot product. We use uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Uh, we use compression. We use query parallelism and a scale out architecture. MemSQL is a distributed data store that scales across hundreds of nodes. And the result of this is that we can process at memory bandwidth speed. And once we're at that point, we can start to add nodes and add CPU with the confidence that we're making use of the hardware that we have here. And you can imagine that when you're dealing with the, the volume of imagery that we have today on the internet, and while we think we have an infinite amount of compute resources, and we kind of do with all the clouds uh, that are out there, you know, it's still very important to pay attention to machine efficiency and process efficiency. And some of the software techniques here, uh, like SIMD, just allow us to be very efficient about the minimal manipulation of bits in order to get to a result. So uh, you know, that essentially translates into the ability to do vectorized queries. This was mentioned briefly in uh, Matei's keynote yesterday. Uh, but again, being able to process multiple, uh, multiple pieces of data in a single instruction uh, allow us to squeeze every last bit of efficiency. And you know, if there's one takeaway uh, in, in this part of the talk that I'd like you to remember, it's just you know, how do we drive the utmost inefficiency, moving the fewest number of bits around in order to get to a result. Uh, so today I'm going to do a demonstration on a, a single node. And the reason for that is I want to showcase the uh, the memory bandwidth usage in, in a very uh, you know, well-defined uh, framework. So you know, in average, a single node is going to have about 50 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth. Today, we're going to be doing feature vectors of about 4K. And so if you do the math there, you know, the theoretical maximum uh, would be about 12 and a half million images that could be processed or scanned per second per node. And then, of course, if you want to scale out, you, know, you could easily get to a billion, you know, one and a quarter billion uh, images per second if you did that on a 100-node cluster. And we have several customers who have done MemSQL nodes on that cluster count. So you know, this is sort of the, the picture of scalability and feasibility. But, but let's go back to you know, the core of where we're starting. This is a chart from the folks at Anantech. I love these folks. They do all this low-level measurement. Um, and so I just highlighted here the shaded orange cells are the ones that are in this range of 37 to 61 gigabytes per second. And you can see sort of fairly common. And you know, the last platform on the right here is uh, the Intel Broadwell V4. Uh, in today's demonstration, I'm going to be using an Amazon instance and uh, M4 uh, extra large. And you can see here, that's also the V4 Broadwell. So again, just so you know, uh, you know we're in the right zone when we're talking about 50 gigabytes uh, per second of, of memory bandwidth. So I want to jump into the demonstration now. And there are going to be two parts of the demonstration. One is going to be the creation of the feature vector. And the second part is going to be processing uh, comparisons on images at memory bandwidth speed. So for the 
architecture in part one, the goal is that images come in, uh, you use your favorite framework to build models, train models, classify images. You know, a great example of that would be using Spark, uh, and then output uh, of there with the modeling. Now, there's a whole range of uh, frameworks available to do image recognition. OpenCV is uh, open source computer vision library is a very popular one. A uh, couple of things that we like about this is designed for computational efficiency, strong focus on real time applications. Uh, written in C++, which we like. MemSQL is also focused on C++. Uh, but there's many, many options out there. So this is just one uh, that you can choose from. And then more specifically, we're going to use uh, the hog descriptor, the histogram of oriented gradients, the hog feature descriptor, uh, to uh, show you an example of uh, creation of a feature vector. I did a little bit of searching uh, last week on Google. And I found uh, this example from Carl uh, at MIT. And he sort of shows you an, an example of what the, the hog descriptor does, which is essentially to subset an image into quadrants and then determine where's the gradient and what's the angle of that gradient, and then use that for the classification. So this is the example of the hog descriptor. And if you squint, can anybody take a guess at what it is? It's a little hard. Anyone want to guess? Somebody said a car? Yeah. If, if, can anybody guess the model of car? Now, this is unfair, because this is probably a, a very uh, a model that I've seen mostly in the US. But you'll see in a second. But it is a car. Um, and so when you look a little further, you can see it there. Can anybody guess the model at this point? Hummer, Hummer is close. It's a, it's a Toyota. I think they call it the FJ Cruiser. Um, but you can see, you know, it, it's interesting how you know, the, the, the hog descriptor uh, gives enough of a shape that the computer can start to calculate similarity based on uh, these gradients and how the gradients are oriented. So this is you know, a little bit of the underpinnings of, of how this stuff works. So to run through a simple example, uh, I just put an OpenCV environment on my laptop here. And I'm going to generate a hog descriptor on my profile picture just to show you how this works. So this is, again, very basic. In practice, you'd be doing this uh, most likely on, uh, on your Spark cluster. So um, I'm going to go to my OpenCV environment. And I'm going to activate that. And I'm going to run my script on my profile picture. And now I've got my feature vector. And then I would take that feature vector and place it into a MemSQL uh, table. And then I have all the tools I need for SQL or for doing, uh, you know, enabling anybody in my organization who knows SQL to make use of that information. So I'm going to go back to the presentation mode here. So that's the first part of the demo on generating the feature vector. Again, the example I used with OpenCV and the hog descriptor, there's many examples there. Um, I don't need this because the demo worked. So now we're going to go on to part two of the demonstration. And here, we're taking the output from Spark, and we're going to put that in MemSQL so that we have it in a persistent queryable format. And from there, we can start to build real-time image recognition uh, applications. And so again, just to, to recap, uh, we're making the assumption of the memory bandwidth at 50 gigabytes per second. Each vector is 4K, and so you know, scanning through all of those vectors should take about one second. And I'm going to run an example uh, here where we're going to select all of the uh, uh, feature vectors, and we're going to use this dot product implementation, uh, which we have built into MemSQL, to determine the degree of similarity. And here, you know, I'm saying 99% similar. So I'm going to jump to uh, SQL Pro. One of the nice things about MemSQL is that while we set out to build the world's uh, fastest relational SQL database, we didn't want to reinvent client infrastructure. And so while MemSQL is itself, it's all its own software as a database server, you can connect to MemSQL using any MySQL client or any MySQL development environment. And so I'm using SQL Pro just because it's relatively uh, easy and, and simple. 
And so I'm going to shift over to that uh, to walk through the, the second part of the demonstration here. So now I'm in SQL Pro. And uh, just to show you, I'm going to show you the leaves. We only have one leaf here. I can actually show you the, the console. Um, so this is the MemSQL Ops console. And we have one unit here. This is the M4 extra large uh, that's on, on Amazon. Uh, one leaf. I'm going to take a look at the tables here. And there's my features table. I'm going to describe the features table. And you can see it's got an ID and room for the feature vector. And then I'm going to do a select count star. So you can see we've got 12 and a half million images. And now I'm going to run this dot product operation, which is going to say, you know, given this uh, feature vector, what's the similarity to every other feature vector in the table you know, over a set amount? And so that's got uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, characters in there to get to 4K. And so when I run that uh, example, I'm going to see, you can see here, that took just 385 milliseconds, which is far less than a second. Does anybody have a guess as to what little tricks are happening in the background to make that happen? So if, if you recall on one of the earlier slides when I talked about uh, vectorized queries and some of the performance enhancing techniques, one of them is compression. So we can actually do operations on encoded data uh, that's compressed data. And that allows us to basically game the system a little bit and start to do these operations at greater than memory speed. That one actually was a little bit uh, slow. So I'm just going to run it again and see what it comes out to, see if we get any better. Uh, so there we go, just 99 milliseconds to run through that whole table. This is the power of using a SQL engine and software that was built from the ground up to run these kind of numerical operations. It turns out that you know, when you want to compare a string of numbers with another string of numbers, a, a, a native SQL engine is really good at that kind of operation. And particularly when we can include the latest advances in SIMD uh, from uh, Intel. Uh, some of you may be familiar with AVX2, which was the first generation of advanced vector instructions from Intel. They're now uh, in the midst of the rollout for AVX 512, which is making that stuff you know, even more uh, powerful. And again, this is getting back to the, the, the very core innards of the system where, where we're looking to how few bits do we need to move in order to process these enormous volumes of data. So that is the, uh, the quick demo in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully that. Uh, that makes sense. And I'm going to jump back here to the presentation. Uh, so that was the SQL Pro thing. Great. So now I want to talk a little bit about distributed data stores. And you know, if you, if you go out on the internet and you do a search, for example, on something like OpenCV and Spark, uh, one of the pictures that you're going to see is something like this. And this is very typical of you know, what we see in the marketplace today when people are building applications. Uh, there's always some Kafka around. There's almost always some Spark around. And then usually people output into S3 and HDFS. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, HDFS yesterday in the keynote from Ali. I won't have to, I don't feel like I need to go into any more beyond that. Um, you know, and S3 we think is also a, a fabulous place to store data. But neither S3 nor HDFS are great places to build real time applications. And so you know, getting data into one of these data stores uh, does a lot of uh, good in terms of retention and being able to keep things for a long period of time. But it doesn't do as much good if your goal is to build a real-time application, uh, such as the one I showed you earlier with the, the real-time image recognition from the phone. In order to get to human-scale real-time, where people have an expectation of things, you know, human-scale real-time, depending on who you ask, is somewhere around a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, you know, you're not going to see that kind of performance coming out of, of one of these data stores. So that, that gets me into a little bit about MemSQL. And you know, at MemSQL, just in a nutshell, we're a, a, a real-time data warehouse, also with uh, database functionality, very scalable, uh, operational in terms of handling real-time workloads. Uh, we spend a lot of time on uh, integrating with the ecosystem, whether that's various ETL tools, various business intelligence tools. We do a tremendous amount of work with Kafka and support 
the ability to natively ingest a Kafka topic into MemSQL and support exactly one semantics. And we have a highly parallel, high throughput Spark connector I'll talk a little bit more about in a few slides. For our deployment perspective, you can deploy MemSQL anywhere in your data center on any public cloud or also as a service. We have a developer edition that's available on the website that has unlimited scale and no time limit. Uh, it doesn't have the production features like high availability and security, but if you just want to experiment with MemSQL and uh, just you know, see what it can do for yourself, uh, feel free to download the developer edition. If you want to test the high availability and security features, we do have a free 30-day uh, enterprise edition as well. Uh, MemSQL has been recognized in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for data management solutions for analytics. That's a long term, which is essentially the, the Gartner's term for data warehouse. Um, but interestingly enough, and, and, and we're very proud to be associated with, with this group of companies, but MemSQL is also featured in the database magic quadrant, and in particular, uh, very well ranked in HTAP workloads. Uh, HTAP is a term for hybrid transaction analytical processing. The whole idea is if you can land your data in a data store that also supports analytics, you can perhaps eliminate the ETL process. And you know, we, we joke sometimes around the office that you know, when you're working in a real-time world, you don't have the luxury or the pain of ETL. And I've, I've never met a person who was happy about their ETL process. It's the process that everybody loves to hate. Uh, but it's going to be with us for quite some time. Uh, but if you're thinking about building new applications and you can land and analyze data in the same spot, that's going to put you in a really good place to deliver these kind of real-time experiences. Uh, today, there are only six companies that are listed in both Magic Quadrants, uh, and that's Amazon, IBM, MemSQL, Microsoft, Oracle, and SAP. Um, and many of those other companies, they have two products, uh, one product in the data warehouse category one product in the database category. In the MemSQL case, it's the same product that is ranked highly in both database and data warehouse use cases. So I want to conclude with a little bit uh, about Spark and, and MemSQL together. I, I don't need to share with this audience, uh, of course, what Spark is, but uh, you know, Spark is defined by the Apache website, is a fast and general engine for large-scale data processing. And we think that because of Spark's ability uh, to work well with other persistent data stores, it provides some unique capabilities to build these kind of real-time applications. So we have a lot of customers that use Spark and MemSQL together. Uh, a very frequent use case, uh, and this is well, uh, well used in the financial sector, is multiple pipelines that are both uh, enhanced with Spark, one through going to a traditional data lake, um, but usually that pipeline, the end-to-end -end latency can be uh, upwards of an hour before the data is viewable from the end consumers. What uh, the banks will do is they'll take the exact same set of procedures that precede the data lake pipeline, have a separate Spark cluster that fronts the MemSQL data store, and then that pipeline that they use for intraday. Uh, but the commonality of their uh, Spark procedures across, across both clusters gives them the ability to maintain this Lambda architecture where they have the data lake, which may be a corporate mandate that everything goes in the data lake, uh, but that's not sufficient to serve, uh, for example, uh, you know, real-time portfolio analysis or real-time stock trading. And so simultaneously, they'll use a second pipeline uh, that needs to operate in the you know, 50 millisecond or 100 millisecond range, Spark to MemSQL, so they can provide immediate access to their users. And so how should you think about using these two things together? Uh, you know, both are fast, large-scale systems. There's a lot of commonality in that uh, both Spark and MemSQL are distributed systems. It's one of the other things we like about working with Kafka is when you pair distributed systems together, you can get a very powerful outcome. Um, while Spark is a general processing engine, uh, MemSQL is optimized for database and data warehouse use cases. And where Spark is great for computation, model training, and classification, MemSQL is specifically focused on SQL computation, persistence, transactions, building applications that retain state, and application analytics. So uh, we do have a MemSQL Spark connector that's available as open source uh, code on GitHub. It's highly parallel, very high throughput, 
and it's bi-directional, allows you through the Spark shell to see, uh, for example, MemSQL RDD and be able to manipulate that very easily. Um, and then finally, just uh, as a wrap up, we do have a, a lot of educational work that we've uh, done over the years uh, in conjunction with O'Reilly. We have three eBooks that are available. All of these cover pipelines that include Kafka, Spark, and MemSQL. Uh, so the first one we did is on building real-time data pipelines. Uh, we did a second one on the path to predictive analytics and machine learning. And just a few months ago, uh, our latest one, Data Warehousing in the Age of AI, uh, came out. So the URLs are there, and I hope you'll uh, have a chance to, uh, to take a look at that material. So that's a, a wrap up for today's presentation. Uh, thanks for the uh, time and attention. Uh, the slides that I showcased will be up on SlideShare uh, tomorrow. So check tomorrow if you'd like to download the slides or ping me on Twitter if you have any questions. And I think we might have a minute or two for a question now, uh, we have four if minutes. there are any. We have four minutes left for questions. Do we have any questions? Great. Well, I'll stick around the podium if you have any follow-ups that you'd like. Uh, thanks very much, and I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>